appreciate the introduction, appreciate people being here. This is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. As Kat mentioned, we had another panel a little bit earlier. There's a lot to think about and cover with these large issues. And so we decided to break it up into two different panels and cover slightly different things. This panel is gonna be really an overview of the Union for the Protection of New Plant Varieties, the history that led us to this treaty, this convention, this organization, and really to where we are today in regards to seed rights and it's particularly the rights of small scale peasant and indigenous communities around the world at the hands of these larger forces. And so I'll go ahead and introduce the other two panelists and comrades who will be speaking with you today. One of those folks is going to be recorded or is we're going to be playing a recording and that's Indra Shekhar Singh and we had to record because Indra's time zone in India it's just too much of a clash with the dominant audiences. But um, Indra is a journalist and a seed policy expert um, who previously worked in the Indian government specifically to put in place laws that opposed UPAV and will be sharing his experience in that regard. And Silvio Rodriguez Cervantes, who is going to be speaking with you live, who's Mexican Costa Rican, a professor emeritus at the School of Environmental Sciences at the National University of Costa Rica, the president of the Grain Foundation, co-founder of the Biodiversity Coordination Network Association of Costa Rica, and the Latin American Seed Collective, as well as the Latin American Alliance for Biodiversity of the Biodiversity Coordination Network. So we have folks here who have rich experience in these issues, and I can just briefly kick us off by sharing where I'm coming from here. Um, and I'm gonna load up some slides to kick off this conversation. So we're gonna be covering some very complex and heady issues, um, but I think that it's great to just get us started and grounded in a very simple question, which is what is seed? And I would love for us each to just take a moment to consider what it means to us. Obviously, that's why everyone is here at this conference, because seed means something to them. But I think we can never spend enough time <clears throat> pausing and considering that before we get into the complexity of the issues before us. So I'm sorry, I, I realize it's a short pause. I'm just conscious of time. Um, I can just share with you that I, I'm sure like everyone here, have a love for seed, but my relationship with seed really started with the stories of seeds, specifically the story of how seeds are being taken away from communities around the world. That was really how my exposure to seed began, not that I hadn't planted seed in the ground or held it in my hand, which I have, but I think really a deep relationship with seed began in understanding the Union for the Protection of New Plant Varieties. And I think the, the stories around that have been stories that have been a lot of trauma for communities around the world, but behind that trauma is an immense amount of power and hope. And I hope that as we think about a lot of the forces that are working to take seeds away from communities, that we remember that power and that hope and remember that the reason these mechanisms exist is because corporations and governments see that power and hope and have seen it as a threat. And so I would hope that by the end of this panel, if we aren't there already, that we can reclaim that power and hope as something that we all deserve, that we all belong to, that we all should hold with us when we're moving through this work. So we're going to get this kicked off by talking about Seed is a collective commons. So before we get into UPAV itself, I think it's really important to trace back to earlier days, far before UPAV was in place. And just as a brief for anyone who is completely unfamiliar with UPAV, this is an intergovernmental organization and a private international plant treaty that has been kind of the symbol more recently in the past decades of the corporate effort to consolidate control of seed. We'll explain exactly what it is. But prior 
Far prior to UPAV, C was a collective commons. It was assumed to be a collective right that communities held. Um, the question of seed rights itself was a bizarre question long ago. You know, this has been a, a perpetual process of 10,000 years of communities working in co-evolution with seeds to develop them and to develop with them and, you know, choosing them for all the qualities that you all are aware of, their resilience, their flavor, their nutrition, their yield. Um, and ultimately, oops, so that's meant seeds in the hands of communities. And that means in situ. So seeds on site, seeds on location, locally available for farmers to be able to cultivate them, to save them, to work with them, to engage with them and be in conversation with them. And this is how we developed the seeds that have sustained humanity, sustained all of our communities. And when we start talking about seed rights, this passage here is pulled from an official UPAV document from 1990. And what it spells out is that the question of rights in respect to plant varieties has not been addressed until the first requests were voiced by industry. So essentially seed rights weren't really a thing until seed industry had a mind to start protecting their markets. So let's go back. Before seed industry started making those moves to what was going on in the US. And obviously there's no one seed story, but we have to start somewhere. And I think it helps to start in the United States considering that it is really the center of gravity for seed patenting, for seed control. And far prior to any of that, we had a country that was built on agriculture. 75% of the US economy was agriculturally focused. The first U.S. presidents all recognized how dependent this country was on seed. I think we can all recognize at this point that the U.S. was built on displacement and enslavement and genocide and colonization, but it was also really built on seed. Um, that the initial seeds that were exchanged with indigenous communities here sustained the initial colonists. And when the newly independent country was formed, it really relied on having seeds from around the world, which ambassadors and military officers were asked to collect and bring back in order to circulate them to the farmers who needed to rely on that to build the budding US economy. And so at the core of that was free governmental seed distribution. And ironically, that happened out of the US Patent Office. So the agricultural division of the US Patent Office was responsible for disseminating seeds to farmers around the country for free. And they did that to the count of 2.4 million packages of free seed per year. That duty transitioned to the newly formed US Department of Agriculture, which was formed in 1862, which took over free seed distribution and distributed over 1 billion packages of free seed. Seed research at this time is really all publicly funded. There were several acts that were set up to ensure that this was the case. One of those was the 1862 Morrill Act, which seized tribal lands and allotted them for land grant universities to be able to study seeds and produce new seeds. Um, and the Hatch Act in 1887, which produced experimental research stations to be able to get those seeds out to communities. I'll take a pause there. Entering a new phase from, from the period of governments recognizing in spite of what they did to indigenous communities and the theft of seeds around the world to grow, that they still were able to recognize how valuable those seeds were, even if they were disregarding the communities responsible for cultivating them. Seed privatization really kicks off with budding seed companies, which at first were not producers of seed, they were just distributors. So seed companies were distributing the seeds that public research institutions were cultivating and breeding and they weren't really producing on their own. Everything was dominantly openly open pollinated varieties. That changes when 
companies come together to form the American Seed Trade Association. 40 years of lobbying ensures that federal seed distribution ends in 1883. So here we see companies who are distributors feeling threatened by free distribution by the government ending, ending that policy. The rise of hybrids. So I'm sure a lot of these are things that we all already know, but um, at this point in time, again, as mentioned, seeds are dominantly open pollinated varieties, but corporations start to focus on hybrids. One, because you can select more for particular traits, but it also gives you a market advantage because those traits don't carry as well from season to season. And for the first time you have dependency. So farmers have to buy their seeds every year. Um, they can't just save them so easily from season to season. That's great for corporate markets. Hybrid corn in the 1930s really kicks off that budding industry and the US seed corn market alone grew to over $70 million by 1944. So as the costs of private seed production increase, now there's a desire to protect that investment. Before there wasn't that need, there was just the inherent recognition that seeds needed to be in humanity's hands and seed rights were a given. But all of a sudden now, there's a need to look at a different type of rights. And corporations really looked at this, I see it from three angles, which is control over the market, control over the genes, and control over the fields. And the main manifestation of this control is intellectual property rights. So I pulled this straight from the World Trade Organization website. Intellectual property rights are rights given to persons over the creations of their minds. It's the idea that someone has invented something and that they should be rewarded for it and that should be protected and people should have to pay to use it. And it's pitched as something that is good socially because it spurs on more investment. The first case of this is the 1930 Plant Patent Act, which was an act pushed by horticulturalists who wanted to protect their creations and ultimately got it in the form of this act, but it excluded seeds. So no sexually reproducing plants, only plants that are produced through cutting or grafting. So first time that plants are patented, but it doesn't patent seeds. And this is also in the US. That changes in 1980 with the first patent on life, which came in a case called Diamond versus Chakrabarty, which was a case that, where the Supreme Court overturned an initial ruling and gave a patent to a scientist, to a corporation, in this case GE, for a bacterium that ate oil spills. After this ruling, the budding genetically engineered seed market has a heyday, starts flooding the patent office with requests because now that space is open. Corporations can go in and try to start patenting seeds. So this is all what's happening in the United States at the time. There is a response on the European side. So while the US is really pushing patents, Europe is fearful of patents. There's the fear that patents will lead to an increase in the price of seeds, that it's gonna to lead to monopolization over foodstuffs. People are gonna to have to pay more for food. And so instead they have to find other ways to start protecting corporate breeders. The first way that they do this is seed certification standards. And this is the rise of what we call the DUS criteria. And that stands for distinct, uniform, and stable. And essentially distinctness means that it has, that seed has to be clearly distinct from other varieties that are registered. It has to be stable. So from generation to generation, and it has to be 
uniform. So the seeds have to look close enough alike. They have to all be similar enough within that pool. So by setting up this criteria, all of a sudden you have an arbitrary set of standards that doesn't actually support what's best for communities. Community seeds, farmer, heirloom, OPV varieties, they need to be adapting and changing all the time to be able to support communities in the way that communities need. But the standards say that adaptation actually makes it much harder to market. We need your seeds to look all the same. We need them to be closer. We need them to be stable and arbitrarily decide that their values are what matters. And they set up seed catalogs to start to impose licensing standards. So only the seeds that are in these catalogs really get marketed effectively. They're pitched as the elite or the good seeds and you start to see farmers get marginalized their seeds don't make the cut. So then we see the rise of breeders' rights. And now is when we're getting into the UPOV territory. Breeders' rights was, again, Europe's response to plant patents. It's this recognition that maybe a patent doesn't make as much sense right now, but let's try to patent, or let's try to put, put protection on the variety itself. And let's assert that breeders themselves have rights that exist beyond the rights of other citizens, beyond the rights of farmers. These are more exclusive and important rights because there's more market value there. And so they set the stage for what will become UPOV. And UPOV, ultimately, it comes out of the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property, which comes in 1883 and shifts into its own entity, its own intergovernmental organization and its own convention. And the basic understanding of UPOV is that breeders are given the rights of ownership over not just the idea. So in the case of a patent, you patent an invention or an idea someone had. In this case, it's the physical seed itself. You possess those seeds, you claim ownership over them by showing that you've done some amount of work to improve them. And in this case, you see that corporations can go in, corporate breeders can go to communities and collect some of their seeds. They can buy some seeds, they can share seeds, and they can select them for a few years, a few seasons, and then claim that they discovered those seeds. And the main thing here is that if you, your seed has to be distinct from other seeds that are registered and on the market, farmers, the vast majority of communities around the world are relying on informal foodways and seed saving mechanisms to survive. They're not necessarily looking to market as their predominant value system. But in this case, if it's not registered and if it's not on the market, if you haven't paid for a license, then that means that someone else can claim ownership over it and then you have to pay to use it. And at first there's only six countries who head UPOV, six European countries, and create a system by which now without patents, corporations can start to control these varieties. In the initial version, so UPOV 61, it's been amended twice since in 1978 and 1991, which I'm going to turn over to Sylvia real quick to cover. Um, in 1961 and in 78, UPOV still held the provision that farmers could save seeds for their own use and exchange seeds non-commercially and that researchers could still use seeds to develop future varieties. That changes with UPOV 91, the most recent amendment which starts to now criminalize and punish traditional seed saving practices. And over time from UPOV 91 or 61 to 91, you see essentially the line be blurred between a system that was set up uh, to be distinct and less aggressive than patents and now blurring the line so it's essentially become a patenting system. 
I don't want to get too much more in the weeds there. I know I've talked at you for a little bit now, and I want to turn it over to my comrade Sylvia, who is going to explain some of the stipulations of these different amendments, these different treaties, and can get into yeah what UPUV actually looks like in practice. And then we'll hear from our friend Indra, and I will be coming back with a little bit of a conclusion at the end before we get into questions. So I will turn it over to Sylvia. Okay, I will try to put, uh, to share my screen. So please, just a minute. Yeah, we're, we're okay. all good to go. go ahead. Let's go. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, then my, my title, um, mi, mi titulo es sobre... The title of this presentation is about the UPOP. And I am going to focus on two main issues. One, it's a comparison between UPOP 91 and UPOP 70A. However, I would like to give a brief introduction. Many of the things we cannot fight against alone. We need to take into account the hosts of public and private organizations that are trying to promote it. In my screen, I can see where you are, in which slide are you? So I am blind to say so. Rebecca, can you tell me? I will try to speak without reading the screen. First is the introduction. I would like to briefly refer to these treaties and how relevant are they for the uh, legal framework of the countries that are involved in international treaties. And then I would like to present to you another slide. It's like a puzzle where you see all the international treaties and we need to understand them. Otherwise, we are going to get lost uh, with different names, with different figures and conventions. And then I would like to talk about the difference between UPOP 78 and UPOP 91. Uh, Justin already mentioned some of them. If you go back, we are in the pyramid, in the slide with the pyramid. Well, in this pyramid, I'm trying to speak out of my memory. With this pyramid, I try to represent the different degrees of importance that regulations have in countries like Costa Rica. For Latin America, uh, it has been very similar. In the bottom part, you see a host of national laws and executive decrees in different countries with different names. But that's the first level. That's the basis of this pyramid. Those are the majority that are done in every nation. Laws and regulations. And on top of that, uh, we have fewer uh, international and international agreements. Uh, so you can see the relevance of UPOP because it's an international treaty. It's on top of the national laws. So what is stated by UPOP is going to be very relevant. The only difference is that for a country in order to be accepted in the UPOP has to have a piece of law for plant breeders' right. So once the country 
wants to enter to the UPOP, they need to present that piece of law. Therefore, UPOP is going to accept them because it's going to be in accordance with the guidelines that they are approving. This is a very specific issue in UPOP because according to other international treaties, the country requests to be accepted by the treaty. And that covenant not necessarily demands to have ahead of time a national piece of law to make sure that with their legal framework, they are not going to change anything about what the entity is demanding. After international treaties, we have the constitution in the case of Latin America countries. And I think that's the case in other countries. Constitution is the main uh, piece of law. That's why it's in the peak, in the top of the pyramid, international treaties have a mandate. They have to re-read the constitution. So constitution can be adapted to treaties instead of being, being the other way around. And on top of the pyramid, we have human rights. Allegedly, they are on top of all the law of all the countries. And this is important to mention in this pyramid because this is the way we can understand how UPOP has this character. It is a treaty, it's a convention that has been adopted according to the requirements that every country demands. And that's why the, it is so important. The next slide, please. This is another slide, and I cannot see that in my computer, so I am speaking by memory. I am trying to present to you a host of figures. You can see how international treaties that are so relevant can miss, uh, mix and match. And they have to do with two issues that we are dealing with in this workshop. One has to do with uh, intellectual property rights and others that have to do with biodiversity, wild biodiversity and tame or domesticated biodiversity. In this host of uh, presentations, you will see that we have the WIPO as well as a free trade agreements in Latin American countries, we were obliged, many countries, to sign and to adopt UPOP 91, mainly the 91. Well, the free trade agreement obliges adamantly to sign this, otherwise we were not going to have a free trade agreement. And we have uh, the World Trade Organization present in this puzzle. They have a specific section dealing with um, intellectual properties. In Article 27b, for the first time in the history, they state that an international treaty obliged the signing countries of the WTO to give property right to life, plants, varieties with patents or with the UPOP in a discreet manner. So these treaties, as I presented to you in this puzzle, they intertwine. In brown, you see the commercial treaties. In green, the Biological Diversity Convention and the 
phytogenetic treatment for the fowl that allegedly they should be more rigorous, rigorous, rigorous to uh, protect seeds, biodiversity and the rights of the breeders, but they are weaker. If the other treaties are not enacted, they are very rigorous. They have specific international committees. Uh, on how they are going to fight for their rights together with well-paid lawyers protecting the rights of ones and the rights of others. So in a specific terms, the rights of the biodiversity uh, convenient agreement and the it graph agreement have no claw they have no teeth the others have punishment sanctions so this was the first part of my speech and now i would like to explain to you in a nutshell what is wipo 91 and the difference with WIPO 78. The next slide, please. Yeah. Main differences is the name of this slide. Well, the main differences between UPOP 91 and the other one, well, uh, I am uh, speaking by memory, remembering my work. Here you can see in the next slide, a big circle, that one. This is UPOP 91, differences with UPOP 78. In the circle with red letters, you see the right for phyto enhancer, the person that made a small modification to a plant variety under UPOP 78. The next phyto enhancer could take the altered variety and can continue and obtaining at the same time the rights of a new phyto enhancer and that's why you see the arrow a phyto enhancer takes the protected variety but they can continue with the enhancement under upop 91 this is no longer possible if this new phyto enhancer cannot proof that the variety that he tried to reform or change is not completely very different if he sells it all the rights that's why the arrow is going backwards the rights of the phyto enhancer would be for the original phyto enhancer the first one this is one of the main changes, and that's why there are many phyto enhancers in our country that are against this change, because now they are not free to move forward, and they are afraid of the fact that if they make a new variety, if they create or they produce a new variety, the rates have to be reverted. If it is not prove that they are really different under the upop language it's it states essentially derived otherwise the rights are going to go back to the uh, number one phyto enhancer another change in the case of the peasants rights and the readers rights as justin already mentioned 
before they were able to use this variety for their own matters and depending on the law of the country because as i told you of the, at the beginning to be part of upop you need to have a piece of law a national piece of law according to that and the country has the countries have some freedom to consider a bigger right or a minor right of breeders and peasants so you pop 91 insists in the fact that once the variety has received the the right is going to belong to them and anything that you do in as it is written in the lines these are the main changes but others changes are applicable too the Sylvia? phyto enhancer can have a better so i'm sorry to interrupt i just want to let you know that you have five minutes left okay okay thank you justin entonces en 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 el pueblo 91 so under UPOP 91, they have rights for the post harvesting and other rights. In the night, the next slide. The next slide, please. Other consequences, yes. Well, that change uh, under UPOP 91 affects phyto enhancers and breeders but it has to do also with biodiversity these varieties need water agrochemicals so there is a whole change in the ecosystems when they use these vari varieties with stronger consequences the next slide please Last year, there was a strong drive and effort from the countries to organize a campaign, a campaign against the UPOP for its uh, anniversary. But we have to take into, a, into account the fact that UPOP is not an independent agency because uh, Justin mentioned already this, and there is another aspect that is hurting the seed. I think that in the next slide, you can see something holding the seed. That it's not only the, the, the law, but the certifications, because there is no international agreement supporting them, but there are strong pressures making countries trying to adopt these certification laws that oftentimes are even harmful that you pop because if the peasants seed is not in compliance with the requirements of this law the peasant cannot trade this seed and that would be the end of the agriculture because the peasant is not only producing for uh, their own food but parts of that harvest is going to be profitable for them so that's why in this slide i am saying that these are arms of the same uh, tool and i want to mention also that late, lately by the end of the last decade people like or agencies like the upop is getting together with the ogde and other private organizations like the isf and a peasants organization and international uh, growers to get together so Sorry. they want to become stronger sylvia i'm about to finish Okay, okay. Sorry, I just want to let you know that you got one more minute. 
In the next slide, you see that these organizations are uh, getting together as chains so they can be stronger. And for consolidation purposes, the last slide, we have a question. What can we do in order to form these same chains with breeders, peasants, organic agriculture, in order to have the same strength as these other entities are having? Because it seems to be that these organizations are against the peasants and against the control of um, seeds. Yes. Are you? I didn't know if you were still. You yes, yes, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm sorry because my the technology and also the possibilities of, of having this type of, of um, uh, well, technology uh, from Costa Rica, from our places. It's not the same as the, 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 the you guys have up there. No worries. Really appreciate all your insights and your work over many years doing this struggle and carrying this fight forward. And so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead. Sylvia brought up a lot of information. I'm going to try to spend some time to explain a little bit of some of those things that she brought up and the dynamics at play. And then we're going to try to, I know this panel is short on time considering all the information to get through, but we're going to try to get as much into Indra's presentation as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. All right, so As Sylvia just explained, we've seen some significant changes in UPOV as it's been amended over the years. In the UPOV 61 and 78 versions, as I mentioned, and as Sylvia mentioned, farmers are still able to save seeds for their own use and exchange seeds for their own use non-commercially, and breeders are still able to breed seeds for research. Now, as of 91, those things are both excluded. They were included in what was called farmer's privilege. Now they are criminalizable offenses. And now it's not just the seeds that belong to corporate breeders, it's also the harvest. So any product of those seeds also belongs to the corporations who have the ownership or control over those varieties. Um, if say a corporation finds that a community has saved seeds illegally, exchange seeds, sold seeds illegally, that can mean that that corporation can seize their harvest, the equipment that used to harvest, the land that they harvested that uh, those crops on, and the storage facilities they used. So 91 has been a dire shift in terms of farmers criminalization. Sylvia also brought up some institutions that I just want to cover real quick for folks who don't know. So one of those is the World Trade Organization, which is the body governing global trade and sets the rules for how trade happens between countries and the most powerful countries determine how those rules function. And apologies for anyone who was on the past panel and has already heard some of this. The World Trade Organization has a, an amendment called the Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, otherwise known as TRIPS. TRIPS has been the main lever by which UPOV has been imposed on countries. So essentially, prior to UPOV, very few countries, or prior to TRIPS, very few countries had signed on to UPOV. As of TRIPS becoming a mandatory requirement for WTO membership, now you've seen an explosion in countries who have been pushed into UPOV as a result of needing to have an economic livelihood to survive and that they need to meet the requirements in order to be able to trade with other countries. And there's three different ways that that requirement can be met. One is through a system of patents. The second is by imposing UPOV. And the third is by having a sui generis or a country's own system. 
UPOV likes to present itself as the only solution. So it tends to pitch that the only way to meet the TRIPS requirement is to join UPOV 91. It's a fallacy, but it's worked really effectively. And a lot of countries have been pushed into UPOV as a result. So it's really become an arm of the World Trade Organization. UPOV is centered at the same headquarters as the World Intellectual Property Organization, which functions as a different arm of the World Trade Organization, setting the rules of intellectual property. And the way one of our other presenters, Indra, puts it is that it's the myth of a free market. The World Trade Organization exists to promote a competitive free market. But if you have a monopoly on seeds, there is no free market that doesn't exist. And so essentially the effects of these policies, we're looking at a new seed regime. Um, you all might know this stat, but we've seen incredible corporate consolidation through intellectual property rights. Today, just four companies control over 70% of the global seed market. That market will be worth 92 over 92 billion dollars by 2025 those four companies are bayer monsanto dow dupont chem china syngenta and bass f and what we've seen is essentially a colonization of biodiversity sylvia mentioned some other bodies um treaties that i can just briefly discuss one of them is the Convention for Biological Diversity, Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD. That was an agreement that countries signed on to in 1992 to protect, protect national sovereignty over biodiversity, to say that nation states have sovereignty over the biodiversity that's within their borders. But essentially what we've seen through these new mechanisms like UPOV is that those borders don't matter anymore and corporations can go in and control biodiversity from afar. UPOV was pitched to stimulate seed diversity, to stimulate seed breeding. These are how these treaties were uh, taken in and, and given credence because they were seen to be something that would, or pitched as something that would help humanity. But as a result, since the 1900s, we've seen a 75% loss in genetic diversity available for plant breeding. The public seed sector has effectively been erased. We've seen a marked flow of resources from public seed research institutions to the private sector. Local markets can't exist if you don't have local seed. If the seed is controlled by the corporations, that means that they can also take, take the chemicals that you need to grow that seed, and they can really regulate your food market. And out, now we see a shift towards global commodity chains. There is very little in the way of social and cultural and environmental aspects that's recognized as a right or as important within these bodies. Essentially, they value market innovation, does this allow a seed to be better marketed and traded. If it does, it's worth protecting. Its social, cultural, and environmental value is a non-factor. And so we've talked about from the, the beginning, seed is collective commons that's assumed farmers' rights to seed. And you had farmers' privilege under UPOV 61 and 78, that there's an exemption and now you see farmers criminalization under UPOV 91. Now it's not even possible for farmers to hold on to the seeds that they've always had, that their communities have always had, that now just that basic right is being challenged. And just wanted to use this little quote to give you a sense of that. This is UPOV's vice secretary general. He said, it is up to the institutions that are concerned with farmers' rights to explain what farmers' rights mean and what rights should be given to what farmers. It is not UPOV's business. So I'd like us to just pause and take stock of the implication of something this vast. At this point in time, essentially every country, not every country, but essentially every country has subscribed to UPOV-like laws. They have been pushed in or they have pushed other countries in. Um, and this is currently more than anything the governing body for global seed. 
As Sylvia explained, there are many other mechanisms by which these work, but UPAV is an incredibly vast network that has worked as an arm of those other mechanisms and has done so much to take away what has been such a fundamental right and, um, and the foundation of our resilience, our livelihoods as communities, especially for peasant small-scale farming and indigenous communities in the global south whom these treaties and laws have most targeted. There's a lot more I can get into, but I want to make sure that we get to Indra's presentation. Indra has an immense amount of rich experience in India, which is one of the few countries that has not signed on to UPAV, and his role within India's government was specifically to resist UPAV and put in place laws that could meet that TRIPS requirement without having to impose UPAV. So Becca, I know we don't have too much time and we might not get to the, four, or the full presentation, but if you would be able to roll that, that would be fantastic. Gladly. So I'll get this rolling. And if you could give me the thumbs up when you see it playing so we know it's, it's going. India is a country that does not allow patents on seeds. You know, our, our Indian Patent Act of 1970, and along with that, the, the Plant Variety Protection Act and Farmers' Rights Act, that does not allow patents on seeds because we think as a civilization, as a country, as a subcontinent, that seeds have life and humans cannot invent the seed. It's a natural process, which I think many of the modern day scientists will agree to. It is a sentient life being that is communicating, talking, and that's what the real seed is. Because without seed, there is no agriculture. And a country that depends on like 60% uh, of, of our population, which is about 700 million people, we know they directly depend on agriculture. So you have to ensure that the seed sovereignty remains. Coming from a farming family, I knew that seeds were very important. And my family that's been farming for at least 500 years, you know, we had our own little seed traditions. And which eventually with the coming of industrial agriculture and the green revolution got eroded where seed was no longer kept in our houses and no, was no longer a community thing, but rather had become something which the farmers bought every day. The corporation of the world looked at India and they saw an emerging agriculture sector. They knew that they had to place their bets in it, not only place their bets on it, on it but also control it from the foundational level. So, so they came in with the green revolution and they said, well, who are the first people that we can displace? First, being the bull, which was sacrificed for the tractor. Second, the woman and her knowledge and the knowledge that's passed through her of seed diversity, of biological diversity, of life, of planting, of nurturing. So they had to take that away. The, the corporations knew that now if you have to remove this, 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 this thing that's already happening, then only can we make money. Because if the women do all the seed work, why would we go to the to market to buy them? And the third thing that they killed was indigenous knowledge, the knowledge of farmers, the knowledge of, of which is passed down from, from farmer to farmer and through village through village and through our own native uh, agriculture wisdom that we had kind of stored up as a civilization. So these three things were attacked. First, you got the tractor to, to kind of to take the farmer's money away and plow the lands faster, creating a lot of migrations. And then you took away the seed from the woman and you take her biodiversity knowledge, you, you take her freedom. And you ensure that no, the seeds that only we sell are the good cells are, and everything else is just bad. And then you bring about these laws which, allow, which, which only allow, in effect, corporations to sell, and, uh, sell their seeds. Because women can't maintain certain scientific, you know, these, these industrial standards, which basically ensured that the seed had to move from the woman's hand or the woman's farmer's hand to the corporations who could then conform to these standards. And the third, they sent in the agriculture scientists. And, you know, when Green Revolution was happening in India, the seed was considered sacred. And when these agricultural scientists and helpers went about, for example, in areas like Punjab, they started to go in the night and, and just spray these Green Revolution varieties onto the farmers' fields because the farmers would not accept them in the daytime. They said to the, to the agriculture scientists, and so many farmers have told me this, that this is an American seed. This is an alien, unpure seed. 
and although American and Anpur have nothing to do with each other, but they always thought that this is not the product of nature and that's why it's, it's impure. And, it, and it's just, uh, it's not good for, for our lands because agriculture is still sacred. We are, we are basically working on our mother and we cannot allow these foreign things to come here. Yet they did that. The Indian agriculture scientists did that. And while they were doing all this, a certain companies or certain people were minting a lot of money. If you look at some of the biggest Indian seed manufacturers, they've all emerged from and after the Green Revolution. For every seed company, there may be a hundred thousand women who've, who've lost their who've lost their role in their family to cultivate and save seeds. This is how the seed angle and the seed story was taken away from us. Today, Indian young Indian farmers don't even know how to save seed properly without moisture. Earlier, everyone knew it because every, gra- every house had a small granary or a seedry in, in there or every community had one. So, so that's where the, the Green Revolution has got the Indian farmer to. And once we live in, in another generation of this, we would have lost our seed forever. And keep in mind that while all this is happening, there are international attempts through UPOV and through the International Plant Genetic Resource Treaty to take away our seed sovereignty and take away our germplasm for private profits, giving nothing back to the communities that have worked with nature patiently, striving for that nutrition, striving for with that plant to develop new varieties that could feed the world. So UPOV comes in like two or three ways. What is, of course, if you sign their treaty and then you abide by all the lo- rules, But then there is this uh, UPA of bullying, which I think is an indirect way where these companies come about and they implement the UPA of standards on farmers. In India, the biggest uh, IPR case was happening, which is the intellectual property rights case, which involved the company Monsanto, now Monsanto Bayer. And, you know, there was there was this Indian company called NSL, Nuziviru Seeds. And along with that, Dr. Vandana Shiva and some other uh, some other people were, were parties on this case. And what when, uh, my work then involved preparing legal drafts and, you know, working with the legal team to ensure that our case is heard. And, you know, that time the case was being heard in the Delhi High Court and later it went to the Supreme Court. But I got, I, I basically got involved with the case when the case was in, high, in the Delhi High Court. And that was my first exposure to, to the whole UPOV battle. This case, was, was, was about that how Monsanto buyer had illegally taken royalty money on every packet of seed sold in the country. And this, this, uh, this, uh, this seed, Indian seed manufacturer, Nuzi Vidu Seeds, had, had refused to pay the royalty fees or the trade fees to Monsanto buyer, claiming that Indian laws do not allow for patents on seeds. How can you take royalty money when the Indian legal system does not allow for it? The Indian Patent Act of 1970, which under the Article 3J says that plants cannot be patented. And then later, after, after TRIPS came into effect, there was the Protection of Plant Varieties and Farmers Rights Act, which came into effect and, and then again stated that seeds cannot be patented. And mind you, by this time, billions of dollars you know, had been taken away from the Indian peasant, an Indian cotton farmer, straight to Monsanto and buyer. 2001, you know, since the introduction, of course, the illegal introduction happened in 96, but the legal introduction happened in 2001. And since then, you know, these, these trade fees and these royalties have been charged on poor Indian farmers. And a result of which we can see that 84% of the 400,000 uh, suicides in the last, like, maybe over a decade come from the cotton areas. And price of seed kind of escalate. And what that entails is also that the price of seed, which is now being sold at, you know, maybe some 60,000 times inflation, you know, there was 60,000 times inflation, in fact, even more than that. When we, when we talk about pre-Monsanto seed, cotton seeds and post-Monsanto cotton seeds. So this company had refused to pay the money. They'd refused to pay the royalty fees and Monsanto had taken them to the court. The then Delhi uh, High Court ruled in our favor. And it said that, yes, this is, uh, this is not in line with the Patent Act. This is not in line with the uh, Farmers' Rights Act. Monsanto buyer does not have the right to charge the, uh, the royalty fees on us. So in terms of reparations, that, that stage could never be got because Nuzi Vidu Seeds and Monsanto buyer reached an out-of-court settlement. So 
basically it was corporate brotherhood that prevailed over farmer rights and everything else. And at that point, I also resigned from my position. Uh, and, and I said, I cannot work with a person like Monsanto and Bayer, especially when they're coming to, to overrun all our laws. Because there is no question now as the principal, one of the principal guys in the case, they have, they've said, okay, we made a settlement. It doesn't matter now what the rules are. And you see why that is extremely hazardous for the future is because now that has set a, a judicial precedence, which will then always be used to implement UPOV in India. But now let's, but let's, let's forget what happened then. You know, this is like a, maybe a year or two ago. Let's, let's focus on what's happening now. Even today, the same royalty and trade fees are being charged. And keep in mind that the Monsanto international patents on the BT Cotton 2 has expired already. So Monsanto buyer, without even having an international patent, you know, they are still collecting royalty fees and licensing fees to all the Indian seed manufacturers. So that's how deep their pockets are. That's how deep their infiltration is of the seed sovereignty networks of this country. What is happening even again today is that Monsanto buyer are now entering private agreements with seed companies. But it's the same thing. So they're, 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 they're morphing the rate and toil, the rate, uh, sorry, the patent fees or the trade fees into a new now a licensing fees, which is essentially the same thing and the same costs, you see. And the Indian farmer gets no respite. So, so the thing is that this is a, a case of like international biopiracy, which is taking place. It, it is a case of, of, of complete, uh, you know, a deep rooted exploitation of some of the most marginalized people in the world. So UPOV does not only come in one form. They're very, they're very innovative when it comes to trapping countries to conform to their laws. And mind you, UPOV is a private treaty of, of, of members. It's not an international body formed by the UN or any other, any other organization. So it's a private group of people and countries now who, who've decided that their standards should be the standard. Because UPOV first came to India in, in, a, in a hijacking kind of way through the seed royalties and the trade royalties that I told you about. But in another form, and especially this again, my work with the National Seed Association came through, through on the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources. And this was a major uh, treaty discussion, uh, which allowed for shifting the national resource of plant, uh, plant genetic resources onto the international uh, domain and having basically very little uh, taxes and, and having a free market. Okay, if I was to summarize this, to have a free market in a world where there's already a, a monopoly, okay, opening up new markets and their new germplasms for all these companies internationally to just exploit. So basically, if the treaty came in force, it would have allowed for patents on seeds because that's how these companies would use different areas of germplasm and then claim royalties over it. And that also, that system also conformed to the UPOF system. So India was being trapped not only just in one place, but in many places. So in, for example, and we worked on that treaty, that if India signed and said that we should follow uh, opening up our reserves, allowing for digital patents to come into place, uh, looking over like, you know, these uh, genetic, uh, genetic structures of plants and genomes, and then basically uh, companies even outside India, being able to kind of just access that and then patent those, uh, those, those varieties in their own countries, giving very little back to, to developing nations and giving, and especially given the fact that, that most of the germplasm was, was taken from us and people like us all over the world. You know, today the United, uh, United Kingdom of all places has about, I think, 800,000 like, uh, genes for, for different species and all that stuff. And it's just a tiny island. So how come the Great Britain amassed this great uh, plant genetic resource uh, library or like a, a gene bank? It was all stolen. When we, when we talk about UPOV, there are now some corporations that are going to control the future of these species of these varieties. One of the important parameters of the UPOV is that the farmer cannot sell, cannot, cannot keep more than a certain amount of seed. So you see, everything is linked. Once you have these systems in mind, only corporations will be the keepers of seeds and not the farmers. They would, it will never be possible for them to economically live off preserving their own biological heritage that their ancestors have toiled in and got to them. So this is, I feel, a deep form of racism and colonialism, which is, uh, which, which is taking place through UPOF. So what happened is that, that once Monsanto buyer and other 
and other European seed companies tried to enter India, there was a kind of coming together of, of seed Indian seed manufacturers who started to work with uh, the Indian government to ensure that there is there is the the Indian seed sovereignty remains in Indian hands. Okay, they were very well aware of what's happened, for example, in countries like Mexico, Africa, and, and Brazil, like and how how it's it's a complete monopoly in the seed sector there. And that that does not only entail monocultures, but also it's just bad for farmers and it's bad for the country. The Indian government and the Indian seed manufacturers came together and they formed an organization called the National Seed Association of India. And basically why I was selected for this role is because of my work earlier with Dr. Shiva and my writing and, uh, and other policy uh, areas that I worked in, they thought that, that they needed a person who could actually who understands the seed subject very well, and that too from a from a national uh, from a national standpoint, keeping the patent laws in mind, keeping uh, what what happens what we know when these corporate forces destroy uh, countries. So that was kind of uh, my in into the National Seed Association, and from there we actively pursued a policy as a body to ensure that most of the seed legislation that happens and some of the in international seed treaty agreements that happen are tilted towards uh, our own laws and our own constitution and not the reading of uh, the West and UPOV. You know, we spent many, many hours sitting in those uh, with the bureaucrats, sitting with uh, the scientists, sitting with every with the farmers to kind of come to come on board and suggest a certain seed, a new seed bill for the country. And there you could see that there is also an opposing side. There are, of course, uh, people who, who come from all sides and there's a whole international presence backed by certain people. They are there to push all the policies which actually will allow for UPOV-like things to come into play. And one example of that is that in the forming of the Indian Seed Bill, which was we worked on it all of 2019. And hey. I think we'll need to unfortunately cut Indra's presentation short. He has a number more minutes and there's so much great information in those last minutes and I'm sure we can find a way to make sure that people have access to that. Um, we certainly I can, will. I can briefly cover a little bit of what Indra discussed. He brought up the largest seed IPR case in history, Nuzividu Seeds versus Monsanto, and how ultimately that case was settled out of court. And emphasized corporate brotherhood, didn't really have the potential to shift things in a significant way for the country, how he was elected to be put in a position to essentially create a bill that would meet the TRIPS requirement without UPOV. Um, what he will go on to explain is how folks who were also in the National Seed Association ultimately uh, brought in the corporate influence and the desire to restrict farmers' access to seed. And in the process, that bill, which was supposed to be promising and the most progressive in the world, ultimately got taken the route of UPOV. And, and I think what um, Indra was bringing up is this idea that UPOV can come in many forms. It can be this more formal aspect of signing on to a treaty, but it, it can also be just the fact of these corporations leveraging their capacity to lobby and ensure that whatever laws and bills are put in place in a country make it so that they have control over the markets and that farmers, peasants, indigenous communities have as little access to their own seeds as possible. And I really regret that we don't have more time to discuss and come together and to share as a community here, but I know we covered a lot. Um, I just want us to center on one basic question which is the same question that we started from UPOF has a lot of nuance and we can debate it at many different levels but at the end of the day i think it could go out and something else could be put in its place um what's really at the essence of this is whether you believe that seeds are a commodity or you believe that seeds are a right if you believe that seeds need to be in the hands of communities and as close to the communities who cultivated them over thousands of years as possible, or whether you feel that these seeds should really be in the hands of corporations. And it feels clear to me that that's really where the debate lies, and that with these policies, the reality is they're intertwined with global trade. The reality is the resistance is not clear, but it's happening. It has been happening. It has continued to happen around the world. 
Uh, these are the communities that Sylvia works with, that Indra works with, Indra being a part of the Indian Farmers Revolution, that a growing culture, my organization work with, folks who recognize that at the end of the day, we all have a responsibility as folks who have a love for seed, who have small seed companies, who are organic seed growers and savers, to recognize that these forces are at play and that we need to be mobilizing in a more significant way in solidarity with communities who are in the process of being criminalized, fined, imprisoned, or simply having their livelihoods taken away for just trying to do the most basic act that humans have continued to do again for 10,000 years, which is save our seeds. Um, we've just hit the mark of the time for our panel, but I want us to just come back around the hope and the power of seeds. The reason that we had 10,000 years of unobstructed seed saving until these new corporate pushes um, was because communities know deep down the value of these things. And, and corporations in the US spent 40 years lobbying to end free government seed distribution. How committed are we willing to be? How many years are we willing to look down the line to fight, to reclaim those seeds and to ensure that communities who have already had them taken away can reclaim them as well? Um, so I just hope that we can be centered with that idea of that um, there's work to be done. There's a lot of awareness to be generated. I am just beginning this journey and I invite all of you to be a part of it with me, with us. Um, please, I'll put my email in the chat and Sylvia, you're welcome to as well. Um, reach out if you have more questions, if you have connections, if you have resources, if you have an organization who's involved in this work, um, we want to build coalitions. We want to figure out how we can move forward and how we can start to activate this year so that our story with seed doesn't end, that this is just, you know, this is a continuation of a constant journey. So really appreciate everyone being here. Sylvia, Kat, if anyone has any last thoughts, again, I'm really sorry we couldn't engage people with questions to the degree that we wanted to, um, but please reach out with any other questions, email, and uh, we'll make sure to follow up.